Welcome to the Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Trey Lockerby, and I'm here with Scott Lynn of Masterworks. I'm so excited to talk to you, Scott. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me back. Well, it's been a minute since you've been on the show. You were back here. Uh, you were first on the show in 2019, and you had just started, you had recently launched Masterworks, right? What year did you launch the, the company? You know, I, I mean, I must have been on the show last very early because I think our, I think our first painting that we had securitized with the SEC launched in May of 2019. So uh, yeah, I can't, I, I, I don't recall the, uh, the content, but yeah, I mean, I, I think it must have been right after launch. Fantastic. Well, a lot's happened since then in the world in general, and also I'm sure with your company. So let's talk a little bit about, before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about why you started Masterworks and what got you interested in art in the first place. Yes, it's a, it's a good question. So I, I've been starting technology companies for the past 20 years and also collecting art at the same time. Uh, personally, you know, I have a top 100 collection. I've always been fascinated by by the asset class. I think, you know, my perspective on on I guess the asset class and the art market generally is it's probably the largest asset class that's never been securitized. Masterworks was the first firm to securitize a painting, and when you step back when you step back and think about that, it's kind of amazing, right? Because art is a a one point seven trillion dollar asset class, and if you compare that to the most the most comparable asset class that people know, which is venture and private equity. That's a that's a three and a half trillion dollar asset class, or roughly twice the size. But in in today's world, there's nine thousand firms that help people allocate to venture and private equity. But but there's literally never been an investment product in the art market. So from our perspective, that that's what the opportunity is: is how do you how do you take this asset class and make it investable really for the first time? Why do you think that is? Why do you think it's taken till now to securitize an asset class like uh, art? You know, we we have struggled with this question internally so many times, and and I think the thing that's that's particularly fascinating is art is one of the oldest asset classes. Um, Sotheby's, for example, up until recently going going private, um, was the oldest listed company in the New York Stock Exchange at 275 years old. So the asset classes has literally been around for centuries, and you you would have thought that by now there there would have been an investment product, but but there there hasn't been. Well, last time you were on the show, Masterworks was just beginning to do some research into what actually drives the prices of certain works of art. So I'm curious to catch up with you now and see what you've uncovered so far. Yeah, so we we now today, I guess, two and a half years later, um, have the leading research team in the art market. And we, we publish a lot on everything from returns, correlation, loss rates, et cetera. Uh, one of the common questions that we get, particularly from institutions, is what what drives art prices? Why why do art prices go up? Even though we know that they've gone up for for decades now, um, and in in many cases outperformed other asset classes like the S and P, like real estate, like gold, not only from from a return perspective, but also from um, a risk adjusted return perspective when when accounting for volatility. The the obvious question is why are art prices going up? And I think the, that we, we generally have two answers for that. One is, is the top 1% and demand by the top 1%. So we, we generally believe that investing in art is similar to, to buying um, a call option on the ultra wealthy. The wealthier the top 1% gets, the, the more art prices tend to go up on a global basis. And, and it's important to understand that the art market today is 25% US, 25% China, 25% Western Europe, and 25% rest of the world. So you can, you can literally buy a painting in New York, put it on a plane, fly it to Hong Kong and sell it. Um, so we, we do view it on, on a global basis. The second thing, which, which is really interesting is that art is one of the few asset classes that um, it becomes more scarce over time. And, and what I mean by that is that if you, if you have a, an artist who, who is living, who's well-known, who paints a bunch of paintings and then passes away, at some point, those paintings are donated to museums or institutions. So the supply actually decreases over time. And it, that, that's actually a really, to me, a really interesting concept because think about other asset classes like real estate, there's constantly more real estate being built. Gold, there's constantly more gold being mined. Uh, this is one of the arguments that I think people have as, as to why Bitcoin is, 
is an investment, which, you know, that's a whole separate topic <laughs> that I guess we can debate. But um, uh, yeah, the, 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 the interesting thing about art is that over time, when, when you have a great artist, there, there becomes very and very few paintings that are actually left after, after they pass away. And in many cases, those, those paintings sell for millions of dollars because of that. Well, let's talk about your interest in art, because I know this is what drives you and gets you out of bed every morning and, and why you started this company. Did you have some early wins with art in your own investment pro portfolio? Like what drove you to say, hey, everyone else needs to be doing this? Yeah. So when I when I started collecting art, it was in the late 90s. Um, and, you know, I did it because I, I, I was passionate about it. I had a mother who was who was an amateur artist who grew up with art books. Um, but it, it quickly to me started to become interesting just from a, from an investment perspective. And the main thing that drove that, I guess, like many things was really the, the advent of the internet. Um, so for the first time ever, you had websites, which are publishing prices that paintings sold for at public auction. And quickly within a number of years, you had large databases that tracked public transaction records of paintings. So today there's, there's roughly $60 billion in art that sells every year. Half of that is a public auction. So you have this very big data set that you can, you can analyze to, de to determine things like returns, correlation, loss rates, um, et cetera. So, you know, in today's world, a lot of, a lot of people that, that look at the art market are looking at this data to try to understand how are particular paintings appreciating, how are artist markets appreciating, uh, really, really for the first time, first time ever. So you mentioned $60 billion in transactions a year. What's the overall market cap look like for something like the art market? The, the best estimate is $1.7 trillion. Um, so you can, you know, you can think of that $60 billion a year as, as whatever, a couple percent turnover on the overall size of the asset class. Um, the, the interesting thing about that $1.7 trillion number is it really excludes art held by museums or institutions. Um, which obviously in, in terms of the global landscape is the most, the most culturally significant art, uh, but museums or institutions for, for a whole bunch of reasons, never, never sell their art. Interesting. So in your opinion, knowing that it sounds like it's about 20% the size of gold, which you could say is, you know, a similar asset class in, in a way of store of value or scarcity or any of the other, uh, pro, uh, uh benefits. What, in your opinion, how should investors look at art? What kind of portfolio percentage should it make up for? Well, you know, I, I guess it depends on the investor. So we, we, when we're onboarding investors in the masterworks, we run them through suitability and try to understand what is the size of their overall portfolio? What is their tolerance for liquid investments? Um, City did the very first study on an asset allocation model to art in 20. 18, I believe, and they concluded somewhere between 1.8 and 8% if you look at the art market overall. Um, and, you know, we can certainly talk about performance by segment in the art market, but uh, one of the things that's really interesting about the asset class is as art ages, very broadly speaking, returns go down. And this is something that a lot of people don't, don't to totally understand. So if you take an artist like, like Rembrandt, for example, I can almost guarantee you that if you buy your Rembrandt today for $20 million, you will sell it 10 or 20 years from now for roughly what you paid plus inflation. Um, and that's, that's one thing that I think a lot of new collectors also don't understand. So there's, there's, there's definitely a relationship between recency and return, but those, those returns or those recency periods are measured in very wide increments. So for example, today, Masterworks thinks that the most investable segment of the art market is art created after World War II, which has been roughly 75 years. Um, and just now we're seeing art created right after World War II starting to decelerate in terms of returns. So, so it, it returns are correlated to fashion, but it happens in very, very wide increments. What, in your opinion, is art mostly correlated with? Well, you know, we, we've, we've, uh, we've done this research and it was actually an interesting uh, case study, I guess, uh, for better or for worse, between what our research said and then what happened with COVID. 
So we, we published um, a report on correlation between art and other asset classes at the end, I believe it was in December of 2019. Um, and we basically concluded that, that art is effectively uncorrelated. I think the, the highest correlation um, at that point in time was to, I believe, bonds, and I'm not, I'm not remembering specifically what the correlation was, but it was very low still, it was like 0.2. Um, when we look at it compared to the S&P, depending on the period we measure, I measure somewhere between zero and 0.11. So it's, it's effectively uncorrelated to almost every asset class. Uh, you know, we, we often get the question, why is it uncorrelated? And I, and I think there's a couple of reasons. One is that if you believe that our prices are, are correlated to the top 1%, and as the wealthy get wealthier, our prices go up, then you probably can also assume that on a global basis, that top 1% behaves, behaves differently than, than the rest of, rest of the market. And two is that art is an illiquid asset class. People, people invest to hold it for a very long period of time. Um, so some of the correlations you would see with things like like S and P, that would be more extreme in in moments of of stress. You just don't see because it's inherently an, an illiquid asset class. All right, um, Scott. By the way, I'm getting some. I think it's your hand, maybe hitting the, either the mic or maybe the table. But sometimes uh, okay. you're getting a bit of a bump here and there. So just be Makes mindful sense. of that. Yeah. Okay. Um. And it sounds like if you put your hands together too, the mic will pick that up. So just a couple yeah, of might be that. Okay. related things. Awesome. Okay. So no correlation, <laughs> um, which is fascinating. Um, okay. So give us the lay of the land for the art market. Who are the key players? You mentioned Sotheby's and some of these really old brokerage houses, but what are you as you know, masterworks attempting to disrupt exactly? Yeah, so we're not. I wouldn't say that we're disrupting the the art market. That's that's maybe a, a common misconception. Um, you know, the art market today, I think, is really excited about masterworks because we're effectively taking a pool of capital that hasn't been buying paintings or investing in art and, and bringing it to the art market through these investment vehicles. So, you know, I, I think we're probably the largest buyer in the art market today. So that that in itself makes makes the art market like us. Um, I think when I think about what we're disrupting, I tend to think about the alternative investment universe. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we, we, we really have one of the largest asset classes that's never been securitized. And I think there's, there's parallels in today's world to thinking of that in the context of whatever Bitcoin at $1,000, right? Like when Bitcoin is very early, no institutions were allocating to it. It was all individuals. Um, and it just behaved differently than, than it does today. That's, that's really the status of the art market. You have thousands of collectors, whether it's 5,000 large collectors, 10,000 large collectors, I, you know, I don't know the exact number, but you have, you have thousands, not, not millions who are buying and trading these $10 million paintings. Um, but I think as we, see, as we see investors broadly defined, um, particularly for managed money come into the art market um, that's, that's really, that's really disruptive from a, uh, from, from an asset class perspective. So talk to us a little bit about the flow of funds. So essentially you are, you know, Masterworks goes out and actually purchases a piece of art and then sells the securities. Is that correct? Yeah. So these are, these are qualified public offerings. So we buy paintings with balance sheet capital. We file them with the SEC um, is identified objects effectively. Uh, and then people invest in particular specific paintings. Yeah. So I just want to call that out. Cause it's not like a SPAC where you're going out there and raising capital to then go buy a certain thing. No. And you know, I, I, I would, I would love it if we could pull off that structure the, the reality is it's just the way the art market operates. We have to move quickly, do deals fast, um, to, to find good investments. So, we, you know, we, we, we do it with balance sheet capital. So maybe explain to our audience how much of an advantage that really is, because what does it take to get into the art market in general for someone like just starting out and who are the agents in play and, you know, how, what does the echoes, you know, ecosystem kind of look like? Yeah. So, so I would think about it in two different buckets. One is auction houses. So auction houses like Christie's and Sotheby's, 
And then two are, are primarily mega galleries. So galleries like Bogosian, Pace, um, Hauser & Wirth, et cetera. So these are, these are kind of the main players in the art market. They're the ones who handle most of the transaction volume. Um, the art market is, is not friendly to, uh, to new collectors, right? And I, I think maybe even a lot of your listeners have experienced this. When you walk into an art gallery, and you're interested in buying a painting a lot of people get ignored right like it's not it's not the it's not the it's not the most friendly friendly industry um so i think you know i think i think with massworks to a certain extent we're we're making it easy for people to engage with the art market on an on a painting by painting basis with limited capital um uh, ramp up learn about it and then and then eventually um hopefully get more involved so I've heard you talk about, well, let's just talk about the, the $20 million Rembrandt. So let's just say, for example, you wanted to use that as a store of value and, and Masterworks goes out and purchases this $20 million Rembrandt. What does the price per share look like for an investor typically on something that size? Yeah, I mean, our, our price per share is the same on every IPO we do. So it's always $20, $20 a share. Um, and then minimums, our, our minimum per painting is $10,000. So uh, anyone investing in, in any particular painting uh, would, would invest at least the minimum um, unless we waive that, which we, we do on a case-by-case -case basis. But uh, you know, we tell people to think about portfolio construction across a number of paintings. So similar to any, any other asset class, diversification really matters. And we, we've even seen that um, in a lot of our, our own internal data and I think it's, you know, we, I talked about it with our CFO, but I think it's analogous to, frankly, even public equities, how, you know, it's, it's very hard to pick winning stocks over time. Um, you're, you're probably better investing, investing in an index. I don't know how to think about that in today's world, but <laughs> probably better investing in an index. Um, Have yeah, you guys so thought about doing a, a masterworks index of sorts? You know, we're, we're in, in process of, of working on fun products right now. So rather than, than simply having people pick and choose individual paintings to invest in, um, they can, they can invest in a fund, which, which effectively buys securities and those, those underlying paintings. But, um, you know, an index product is, is far out Our our secondary markets have some liquidity, but they don't, they don't have the required liquidity that, that, you know, it would take for a, um, for an ETF like product. So something maybe more like a REIT you know, but for art. Yeah, that's the right way to think about it. Talk to us about that secondary market because that's relatively new, I think, for Masterworks. Yeah, so so last time I was on, we, we didn't have a secondary market. We launched that uh, in the middle of last year. Um, so we now have people, you know, we have thousands of, uh, of trading accounts open, investors are trading shares and in individual paintings, um, which is which is interesting. I mean, I tell people to think about our secondary market very different than how you would think about an exchange traded security. So it's not, you know, when an investor wants to sell their shares at a reasonable price, they go into the secondary market, they list their shares at a certain price, and that trade might clear in a week. So it's not, you know, it's not like you're buying and selling shares of Google, it's trading in milliseconds, but, um, but there is liquidity for people that are, that are looking to get in and out of these securities now. And what is the turnover look like for getting in and out of those securities? Is it, do you have a, any data around like the average hold period for people holding shares in this, in these kind of pieces of work? Yeah. I mean, we, we have 140,000 investors signed up on the platform uh, today. And I would say the vast majority of those, I don't have the exact number now, but I, I would guess 80% really, really intend to hold those securities long-term. So they're just viewing it as, illiquid long-term holds similar to private equity or, or something like that. So there, you know, there's, there's a small minority of investors who are, who are actively trading, but, but most people still view these as, as long-term investments. All right. I've got a, uh, I've got a very large trash truck going by. <laughs> so I'm just, I'm like waiting to see how much more destruction they're going to do. You know, it's funny. Actually today I was in the office and uh, I thought the fire alarm was going off. And I look outside of the trash truck. <laughs> yeah. Just Same backing thing. up. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Um, let's, let's go there next actually. Um, I just lost your audio. Okay. I see the truck driving by. I think we're good. Oh. Um, so 
All right. So after Masterworks goes out and buys one of these pieces and sells the shares, where does the art live? Is it just in your apartment or where, where does it go? <laughs> Yeah, so we we have um, we have a pretty a pretty good structure in place where we avoid sales and use tax uh, on these investments. So today, every everything is sitting in what's referred to as a free port in Delaware. So we buy the paintings; they go into storage in Delaware. Um, we we do lend them out to institutions for uh, important artist exhibitions or retrospectives, um, as they may be called. But um, but in general, most of them most of them stay in storage. I've heard you talk about the strategy around, you know, something that might drive price is the relevance of the piece of work so that maybe it was just recently in an exhibit. So do you guys have any strategies about it? Let's get this into an exhibit and then let's like, you know, write about the time of sale. Yeah. So, so the art market, I, I guess the way I, I would think about selling a painting is I would describe it as very event driven. Um, so, so you want to sell a painting going into momentum, either because an artist just recently set a price record, there's a museum retrospective or, or an exhibition, something like that. So I, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say that an exhibition itself causes a painting to be worth more, but it does generate buzz around that artist market, which is, is usually the right time to sell. One thought I had just now was that, uh, you know, if I look at this, like other kind of collectibles, maybe fine wine, for example, they have sort of a futures market as, as set associated with it. Are, is there anything like that in the art market? You've got these artists still alive that you know are going to produce more art, but there's nothing like that. Do you see anything like that down the road? I think it's really interesting. I mean, you know, again, the the only investment product for art today is is via Masterworks. The, the only secondary market for art is via Masterworks. So we you know, I think there's there's a, a long road ahead before we get to to option markets, but um, but I think it's I mean I think it's certainly interesting, and there's definitely a lot of people in the art market that would want to make particular bets on individual artists, um, but yeah, it doesn't it doesn't exist now. So, in your opinion, where should we start as investors? You mentioned Rembrandt's and some of these old masters kind of fade into just becoming stores of value and they're not really high yield producing. So I've heard you talk about blue chip works, up and comers, where should we focus and, and do you, how do you allocate you know, between all three of those? Yeah. Um, you know, the answer is it really depends on the investor. So it really depends what the investor's objectives are. Um, masterworks tend to focus generally on two different segments of the art market. One is what I would describe is, is mid to late career living artists. And we, we tend to, to classify artists into two different risk categories. One is an A risk category and one is a B risk category. So the living artists, we tend to put in this, this B risk category. And then in our A risk category, we have brand name, um, well-known artists like Picasso, Warhol, Basquiat, et cetera. Um, probably, probably what you're referring to is blue chip. Um, interestingly, we, we've done a lot of work on these two different buckets to try to understand how do risk adjusted returns differ um, and risk adjusted returns are basically the same so there's not necessarily a right decision or a wrong decision the the living artist bucket tends to be more volatile but have much higher returns generally returns above above 15 percent when we look at historical appreciation the a risk bucket tends to be less volatile and and have lower returns generally somewhere between Eight and twelve percent, depending depending on the artist market. Um, but there's not a there's not a right or wrong a right or wrong answer. You know, one of the artists that that I think is very interesting, which Masterworks is not really that focused on anymore, is actually Monet. Um, and Monet typically is the second or third largest selling artist in in the art market, selling somewhere between two and four hundred million dollars um, in art a year. And the interesting thing about Monet's market is that. Historically, he returns somewhere around 7% uh, annualized appreciation, but the volatility is so low, like his, his returns are so predictable that what, what your listeners would think of as a sharp ratio is actually pretty, pretty outstanding at, at, I think, somewhere around 1.2, um, which in the art market is, is, a, is, a, is a, really good, uh, a really good sharp ratio. So. You know, it really, it really depends on what the investor is trying to achieve. If someone said, hey, I'm just looking for store of value, very low risk, um, you know, my, my target return is 6%, I would point them to someone like Monet. 
if they're targeting 15% plus returns, we would probably point them more towards uh, major significant living artists, but but where there there's there's you know a bit higher volatility. I've I've heard you talk about Basquiat too as a pretty high yielding artist. So how soon would you direct someone to someone like him? Yeah, so Basquiat is is an exception, right? He's he's kind of the anomaly here. So he is a he's what we we define as a blue chip artist, but um, for over over fifteen years, maybe twenty years, his market is appreciated somewhere between fifteen and twenty percent per year. So he you know he's one of those artists where he's he's very predictable. His returns are very high, um, but he's he's arguably the best performing artist in the art market overall. And how often does a Basquiat come to market? I mean, are we, is it every other year? Is it every few years? Is it once a year? Yeah, he, um, you know, there, there's not a lot of work. So he, he died, he died young of a, uh, of a drug overdose. Um, and there's, there's not a lot of paintings, but, you know, I think we'll see somewhere between five and 10, you know, I don't know if I would use the word major, but, but paintings in excess of $15 million trade every year is probably the right way to think about it. I think his market overall is doing somewhere between three and $400 million a year now. And during that time, that piece of art is most likely sitting in some warehouse, not being seen by someone. Is that correct? <laughs> probably sitting in someone's home, uh, most likely, but, but possibly storage. Yeah. Unbelievable. Amazing. Well, you've kind of hinted at the risk ratios, the Schiller PE kind of way to look at this. So what in your opinion is an average kind of a, uh, average kind of a volatility for something like a piece of art? You know, it, again, it really, really depends on the artist market. I mean, we, we see living artists today, for example, who their paintings were selling for, um, $50,000, 10 years ago, 15 years ago today, they're selling for 1.5 million. Right. So just the volatility on on that alone is is very high, but the return is obviously very high as well. Um, someone like Monet, it's it's very low. I mean, I think we see vols less than less than ten percent for for him as an artist. So um, it, it really depends on on the individual artist and their market. I, you know, I would think of art as similar to any other asset class, right? Like there's segments of the art market which are are super volatile, very unpredictable, very speculative, and there's there's other segments which are much more predictable um, and less speculative. So in something like the equity market, which is where our listeners are probably most focused for the majority of their amount of the, spend the most focus, um, you know, right now you have something like the FANG stock. So there's a handful of stocks that are driving the most amount of return, but they're also the largest in market cap. So if we apply that to something like the art market, what which artists would kind of be the FANG stocks and what would be which would make up the most market cap? Yeah, I would, you know, Picasso is usually the largest market. So somewhere between Picasso, uh, Monet and Basquiat, they tend, they tend to trade off. Um, th those are the, the largest in terms of transaction volume. I, I'll get this number specifically wrong, but I believe last year Picasso was somewhere um, in the 12 or 13% of the, the overall market is the, is the largest artist in terms of transaction volume. So you don't, you know, you don't, you don't really have the, the fang dynamic in the art market, but you do have a half dozen names, which are 20, maybe 25% of the market overall. So if art is appreciating in pretty close correlation to the 1%, where does the biggest risk come from? Is it, should we be watching taxes? Should we be watching, you know, just the economy in general? How do we monitor or gauge kind of the risk associated with the art market? Yeah, I, th I think, I think you're, I think you're exactly right. So when we think about risk to the art market, we tend to think about what are the risks of the top 1% um, and what, what will cause them to, to stop buying art. And it's interesting if you, if you go back, I, I, you know, I, I don't know if you recall, um, all the details of the Trump tax plan, but but there were um, uh, there were a lot of changes to 1031s, which allowed investors, particularly in real estate, to roll their gain over into a new asset. And 1031s were actually removed for art um, whenever whenever that was. Those changes went into place three, three or four years ago now, I guess. Um, 
So we thought at that point in time that that could have had a material impact on the art market because so many, so many particularly big collectors really relied on 1031s to continue rolling gains forward. And interestingly, it had it had no impact. Like we we didn't we didn't see prices change at all, which we were we were frankly surprised by. Maybe because 25% of the art market is the US. Um, maybe because the top 1% has so much money now that, that that tax change specifically didn't really change how they thought about buying or, or um, selling paintings. Um, so, you know, I, I guess we think about things like wealth taxes. We think about specific taxes that can target the art market. Um, you know, any, anything of that nature could, could introduce a, a risk to, to art returns. What are the taxes on art in the U.S. right now? Is it similar to capital gains, or if you know, if it's a, like a piece of property? What does it look like? Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a good question. So many people do not know this, but we have this this special um, capital gain rate for collectibles, which today is twenty eight percent. And you can kind of you know, depending on how you define it, you can kind of think of that as a as a as a wealth like tax. It's it's really targeting people who are who are trading trading objects like this. Um, so that that does that does already exist. Now, interestingly, if you're if you're buying a security in a painting through Masterworks and you're selling that security on a trading platform, you're still paying capital gain, not the the, the regular capital gain of twenty versus twenty eight. Um, but yeah, that 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 tax does does exist effectively on the art market today. Interesting, and I you kind of hinted at this, or you kind of alluded to maybe this. Uh arbitrage opportunity where you're buying you know pieces in the u.s going to china where there's a new billionaire every day and selling art is that a pretty common occurrence you know we we don't actually see a lot of that to be honest i mean we we do see it when an artist is um is specific to a region so for example banksy grew up in the uk his popularity is, is much greater in the uk than it is in the u.s oftentimes we'll see banksy sell in London for that reason, even if someone, even if the, the owner of the painting is, is in the US. Um, but generally we, we don't see a lot of shifting, um, you know, of works between, between regions by collectors. I'm kind of interested in, you know, you brought up Monet and Picasso who have a lot of pieces of work out there and it kind of brings to mind someone also like Matisse who, you've just seen prints just go to infinity and you might see a print now at urban outfitters or something. I mean, how do you look at artists as they just start to get kind of uh, diluted down to, you know, even though they're a master and they're well, really well known, is there a dilution factor to this? Yeah, it, it is. It is interesting that for artists, even like Rembrandt, we don't really see prices decline, right? We, we see appreciation approach zero or returns approach zero, but we don't actually see prices decline. Um, you know, could that could that change in the future as the market continues to grow and get bigger? I, I'm not I'm not totally sure how to think about that. I think the thing that that really helps maintain price in the art market again is this this shrinking supply dynamic, because now if I if I want to buy a Rembrandt, there's only I don't I don't know the answer, but I'm guessing less than a hundred good Rembrandts and private collections that I, that I could actually purchase. Um, so I think that helps maintain the price, even though interest from, from collectors is, is declining over time as well. One of my favorite, uh, documentaries is exit through the gift shop. Right. And yeah. it's just such a amazing feature on the art market, but also this, this really, maybe it's well known. It wasn't to me, but this fact that a lot of artists aren't actually producing their own work and even Picasso, right. Was kind of farming out a lot of work and slapping his name on it. How is, how are we supposed to, how authenticated is that through third parties or, you know, and how do you look at the value of pieces like that? So the reality is it's, it's been an accepted practice in the art market for centuries. Um, so, you know, using, using Rembrandt as an example, there's, there's Rembrandt, obviously the person, and then there's sort of school of Rembrandt, which are, are people that worked for him, people that painted on his behalf. Um, it's one, one of the reasons that with a lot of old Rembrandts, there's, there's been authenticity issues because 
so many hands from different people were on those paintings. It's very difficult to tell which which specific section of the painting did he paint versus what you know what sections did other people paint. Um, and we see that we see that same practice today with with a lot of artists. I think the reality is when when artists are famous in their lifetime, they generally sell paintings for a lot, which causes them to, to want to produce as much work as possible. And they can't they can't do it on their own. So a lot a lot of artists have have, you know, dozens, I guess, in certain cases, hundreds of assistants that are helping them create create these works under under their name. And how should we look at the value of those kind of works? Is it indistinguishable or is there some way to know that, hey, this is just from the family of work? Yeah, I don't, I don't think, I mean, we've never seen anything in the data to indicate that if an artist doesn't work on a particular object, that object is less valuable so long as it's generally accepted by that artist. However, we, we have seen a bunch of data with living artists who produce tons of work and, and their market falls apart because of just the total volume of work they're producing. So I think, I think it's, um, you know, our concern is more about what is, what is the volume of work that, that an artist is going to produce and how does that, how does that hurt their market? A, a great example of that is Damien Hirst, who many people might be familiar with. I mean, Damien produces more art than <laughs> a small factory. And, and, you know, he's one of the few artists in the top 100 who's, who's had consistently negative returns. Um, you know, I think we've seen three artists out of the top 100 who, who have negative returns and it, you know, he's, he's one of them. All right. So we have scarcity, which is a good part of value here. Part of the equation events that are driving price. Is there anything else that we should consider as investors that are, you know, producing these returns? Yeah, what, one of the things that we've spent a lot of time thinking about, and, and we don't we don't have clear uh, data on this today, is this the, the question of what role does cultural significance play in terms of returns over time, and and when we talk about cultural significance, we have, we have to first define what what that means. So our internal definition of cultural significance is threefold. Uh, one, which which other significant artist does that artist exhibit with? Two, which institutions or museums collect that artist? And then three, how global is the demand for a particular artist? So we, you know, we've built models where we try to look at cultural significance and then correlate that to future returns. And I, I would say, you know, as much as we would love for there to be a clear correlation between cultural significance and future returns, there, there really isn't. There's, there's some loose correlation, but there, there really isn't a, a clear correlation. But what we do see is that if there is very low cultural significance or no cultural significance, and an artist market is run up and prices, you know, for paintings are selling for millions of dollars, it is, it is potentially risky long term. That it may be hard for that artist to, to maintain those price points uh, if there's, there's low cultural significance. Something that seems to have cultural significance as of late would be the new NFT industry, if you want to call it that. I'd love to hear your thoughts on what is your take on this whole NFT movement? You're, people can't see you, but you're, yeah. you're holding your head in your hands. It's, does it yeah. keep you up at night? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I've, been, I've been doing lots of interviews on this. I, 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 don't, I don't understand it. And, and let, let's talk about it, I guess. Um, maybe from 30,000 feet, the, the reason that we don't, we don't understand NFTs. So one of the things that we've talked about so far is that scarcity drives returns and cultural significance matters. So one of the things that, that we struggle with with NFTs is that you know, the, the investment proposition goes something like, there's a digital image that for whatever reason is important let's just use the word important rather than cultural significant, is important. And because we take that digital image and we put it on the blockchain, it now has scarcity value. And that should cause it to, to, to go up in value in the future. And we don't understand that. And the reason we don't understand that is because when you transfer that digital image to the blockchain, you're not transferring a copyright, you're not transferring any IP, you're frankly just putting a digital image on the blockchain that anyone else can copy. If you pay $60 million for the Beeple NFT that, that recently sold, 
I have just as much right to display that on my wall as you do. So we, we actually don't understand what people are doing at all when it comes to, to NFTs. I think there would be some argument that, that NFTs have inherent value if there was some sort of IP that transferred with these images that people you know, could own the copyright from and potentially profit from in the future. But, but today we, we just, we don't understand what the asset is that people are effectively owning when they purchase an NFT. Well, I understand that part of it, but copyright is not even that common, I think, in traditional art. Is that correct? I mean, even if you're buying the piece, you're not necessarily owning the copyright. So maybe walk the listener through that a little bit. Yeah. So, so it's, uh, it's a bit surprising to most people, but if we go out and we buy a $20 million Basquiat, which we did three days ago, we, you know, we don't own the copyright to that, to that painting. The, uh, the artist foundation owns the copyright or if the artist is living, the artist owns the copyright. So, so buying the object does, does not entitle, um, someone to necessarily own, own the copyright. And why does that matter? I mean, like if you, you buy the piece of art, you can hang it on your wall, but you can't do what, uh, you know, lend it to a museum. What, what is the limiting factor there? Well, the, I mean, the, the, the main, the obvious use case would be royalties. So you take an artist like Picasso, I don't know how much the Picasso family still earns in royalties, but I think it's, I think it's nine figures a year. So there's, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of, um, of earning potential in, in royalties for certain, certain artists. Got it. So the, it's a, so, and that's, and that's the longer term ambition, I think with NFTs is to have a royalty or maybe that's what's happening currently, right? Is there might be some element of turnover and the artist collecting royalties in that way? Yeah, we, we are unaware of a single NFT that has inherited the copyright from, from the artist. Interesting. Well, we touched on a number of things. Um, I'm learning a lot. It sounds like it's okay for an artist to go from artist to producer. Something that comes to mind for me coming from the music industry is something like a Rick Rubin, who's a famous record producer. And, and he's known for just having the final product kind of come across his desk and be like, yep, good or bad, you know, <laughs> kind of giving a seal <laughs> of approval and how that doesn't, that actually adds value, which is really interesting. And another thing is the, the royalty factor that um, someone is still sitting back and collecting royalties on these traditional pieces of art, but not actually on NFTs, which is, I think it would be the opposite. Yeah. I mean, to, uh, to us, that seems like the, the interesting opportunity or the interesting angle for NFTs is that people can somehow inherit a royalty stream when they're, when they're buying an NFT that feels like an investment to me, but otherwise I, I'm getting a digital image that, that has no, no IP associated with it. I, I don't understand that. Well, that would make it a cash flow producing asset, right? Whereas now, you know, art is typically, I would say, looked at as somewhat of a greater full theory asset class, right? Where art is so subjective. That's what, that's probably an argument you get all the time, right? Like a, a, a canvas painted a certain type of blue means something to me and less to you. I mean, how do you, how does that play into all of this? Is it, is it purely psychological? Can you, can you use data in any way to extrapolate from that? What, what's your take? Yeah, I mean, look, we we get, we get that that question all the time. I, I think I you know I I just spin the question around and I say you can look you can you can make any argument you want, but you you literally have an asset class which has been appreciating in many ways for centuries. You know, you, you're familiar with the Da Vinci that sold a couple of years ago for four hundred fifty million dollars. Like like some of these paintings have been around for for literally centuries. And if you track individual artist markets, even, even like Monet, right, that, that market has been around for a hundred and, and whatever, 40 or 50 years now. Um, it, it's hard to make an argument that an artist like Monet is going, going to lose value. And we've just, we've never seen it happen, right? We've never seen um, artists that, that are very culturally significant, like Monet, like Picasso, like Warhol, et cetera, go from, from something to nothing because because taste changes. Now we have seen returns change for those artist markets, but we've never, we've never seen people really entirely fall fall out of favor. Um, and it's you know it's it, it's it, we we do ask ourselves sort of why that is, what what causes that, and I think a lot of it is many of these artists are are ingrained in our culture, right? They're they're supported by museums, they're hanging in museums, they're in art history books that the kids learn in school. Um, they're, they're part of the narrative of, of contemporary society. Um, so for whatever reason, I think, I think that's helped 
kind of establish and, and help these markets um, survive throughout throughout decades or centuries. Well, whether we like it or not, NFTs are happening right now. Talk to us a little bit about the importance of the number of bidders on that recent 60 or $70 million Beeple NFT that sold. Yeah. So we, you know, we were, uh, I mean, I think like everyone else in the world, we were shocked when that NFT sold for, for $60 million. So my first reaction to that was this can't be a real sale, right? This must be two guys to whatever collaborating behind the scenes to, to mark this digital image at $60 million. And it was very surprising to us. So what we what we learned from talking to the auction house uh, that day was that there, there were more than 30 bidders who were registered um, with the auction house who, who were totally unknown to the auction house. And in our world, someone who's spending $60 million on a painting is almost always known to an auction house, right? They're a, they're a large collector, multi-billionaire, very successful. Um, the auction house knows who they are. So, so the auction house basically had 30 people show up from the crypto community to bid on this, this NFT that, that they didn't, they didn't know who they were. Um, so that, that was fascinating to us. I think the thing that was maybe even more fascinating was after that sale, we've seen a few of those crypto people come in and start buying real paintings. Uh, so you, you may have read about uh, 20, 20 million dollar. Um, I believe it was a Dora Mar Picasso that sold. Um, at Christie's to, to one of the people that was registered for the, the NFT Beeple painting. Um, so from an art market perspective, we love that, right? Like we would like to see more and more uh, crypto people come in and start, start buying real art. And is there any, just closing the loop on the NFT thing, is it, I've heard that an NFT is more akin to say like the authentication certification on the Mona Lisa than the actual Mona Lisa, right? You're not, it's, like, since it's a highly replicable piece of art, you're buying sort of this authenticator slip that you can maybe turn around and sell. Is there anything like that in the traditional art market? We mentioned that the copyright is typically owned by the artists or their, their heirs, but is the uh, authentication of artwork valuable at all? It, it really, in, in today's world, it really isn't that valuable. Um, so I'm on the board of an organization called, called IFAR, which is probably the leading art authenticity nonprofit. Um, and most, most authenticity issues today are really dealing with old masters or people who are painting, you know, definitely pre, pre-World War II mostly. Um, for any major artist, there's, there's a book published for that artist called A Catalog Resonate which are the, the published recognized paintings that are, are authentic by that, that particular artist. Um, so if you don't, you know, if you have a painting that's being offered to you that's not in a resume, particularly if it's a significant multi-million dollar painting, in today's world, you just, you just don't buy it. And, you know, it's one of the, the arguments that, that, I, that I have a lot with people that, that don't understand authenticity well, which is, you know, you can argue about whether or not a painting is by Jackson Pollock, but the fact that you're arguing almost, you're already losing, right? Because if that painting is not in history, if it hasn't been exhibited by museums, if it hasn't been talked about in art books, even if it is a real Jackson Pollock, it probably still isn't that valuable from, from, from an art history perspective. Um, so I think, you know, I think this idea of, of, of found or recently discovered paintings, it, you know, it's great to talk about from a from a media perspective, but in, in the world that we live in, we, we just pretty much discount that stuff um, almost 100%. Got it. So there's not the possibility of saying something like a real piece of art, having something on the blockchain that helps keep it value or keep its value or certify it. I don't think so. Yeah. I was recently watching this uh, documentary on Netflix, I think. And, uh, you know, these guys stole something like $200 million from this Boston, uh, you know, museum. And obviously that's not a common risk when it comes to the art world. What was, what my question was around that though, is why would someone do that? It, it seems like you've just marked those pieces of art as, you know, inherently dangerous to own who would go buy that and where would they buy it? Yeah, it's funny. I think we I think we spend our Saturday afternoons the same because <laughs> I, just, I just, I just watched that as well. 
Um, I, the short answer is I have no idea, right? I mean, that that seemed like such a bizarre story of, I mean, they, they also, by the way, you know, I think they mentioned this in the documentary, but they talked about how they cut those paintings out of the canvas when they took them from the museum. I mean, I can tell you, if you cut an old master painting like that out of the canvas, you can't even roll it. If you roll it, the paint will crack, you'll ruin the painting. So whoever did that didn't, you know, didn't know what they were doing. It, uh, they clearly weren't reselling it to someone who cared about art. Um, I, I don't know. It was a good documentary, though. Well, you kind of mentioned the, the quartiles here of like the U.S., China, Europe, the rest of the world. What is the trend, though? Obviously, we mentioned China is very up and coming in their wealth class and art consumption. How do you see that trend continuing? Well, it's it's actually China's been on a on a downward trend. So we you know we talked about how art is an uncorrelated asset class. Um, one of the things that we saw in the art market in 2016, art prices actually decreased when public equities increased. Um, and and you know our best guess uh, is that is that it was really due to two things. One, either to Brexit or two, due to capital controls in China and, and really preventing China from, uh, people in China from moving, moving money out of the country. So we, you know, I, I think at the peak, China was 35, 40% of the art market. Today, it's down to roughly, roughly a quarter. Um, so we have, ha we have seen that shrink. And that's, that's not, by the way, dissimilar to other countries in the past. Like at one point, Russia was, 25, 30% of the art market. Today, I think it's less than 5%. Um, so you do sort of see these, these countries with mega billionaires come into the art market, move it, move it in a big way, increase concentration. Um, and then that, you know, that usually changes over time. Well, let's talk about you a little bit more. So what has been the biggest success you've had in art and maybe what was the worst outcome you've had in the art market? I mean, I've, I've, you know, personally, I would say that, that like any, any collector, any investor, depending on how, how you define it, you know, you make lots of mistakes early on. So I, you know, I, I think, um, I think one of the mistakes I made early on was I focused on brand name artists, um, but I didn't focus on objects that were necessarily a examples. So for example, Picasso, a lot of people don't realize this Picasso during his lifetime created, I think it's 65,000 objects. So a lot of people think, Oh, you know, if you own a Picasso, that's amazing. But the reality is there's, there's 65,000 Picassos, right? You can buy in addition ceramic tile by Picasso for $2,000. Um, so it's not necessarily that, that rare, or that unique, so I think as a collector in, in the beginning, I, I bought a lot of addition work. I bought a lot of, uh, I bought a lot of drawings. I didn't necessarily buy high quality A examples. And, you know, I obviously hadn't had no idea at the time, but one of the things that, that we've studied a lot at Masterworks is how does, how does price point impact volatility and, and how does volatility go down or up relative, relative to price? And, Generally, what you see is what you would expect is the more you spend for a painting, the more volatility goes down and the more predictable returns are, um, which is why we, we fundamentally believe the, the only real investable segment of the art market are paintings somewhere between $500,000 and a million dollars on up. We think it's very hard to make predictable returns if you're investing in, in any, any artwork less than that. Um, so that, that's probably the worst example or, you know, are the worst decisions that I, that I made personally collecting in the beginning. Um, you know, I've had a lot of, a lot of great um, examples of paintings that I, you know, that I bought for, you know, I'm thinking of a painting uh, I, I have downstairs in my living room where I bought for a for million dollars, sold it um, for $11 million. I had a, a painting that uh, uh, I bought by an artist named de Kooning uh, which was a great one. I think I, I can't remember exactly. I think I paid seven and a half million dollars for the, the work. And I think I sold it, uh, a year and change later for $16 million, which from a return perspective in the art market is, is pretty unheard of. Um, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's definitely an asset class where, where you can generate great risk adjusted returns. Like to me, it was always 
when I, when I thought about investing in art, it was never that I could make 50x or 100x returns. It's that I could, could return, I think when I, when I last calculated this thing, personally, I returned 20, 21% of my portfolio over a 10 plus year period. Um, but I could do that without taking a lot of risk. That's, that's what was always so interesting to me. You just, it's very rare to see someone buy a Monet for $10 million and sell it for $5 million. It almost, it almost never happens. Like the store of value characteristics on art are really, really good. So if you can generate returns without taking any, from my perspective, you know, material risks, I think that's, I think that's, that's super interesting. Um, and that was, that was the genesis really behind, behind Masterworks in the beginning. It is interesting because you would think, you know, you mentioned Masterworks has about 140,000 subscribers or that's kind of the market, uh, which is not a large pool. So you would think that there would be some liquidity issues there or that there, that, that there would be more volatility and you have 140,000 people more or less selling things back and forth to each other and that would create more volatility. But are you saying that that's pretty limited on the platform? Is that correct? Yeah, sorry. So, so to think, just think about liquidity overall in the art market. So you have sixty billion dollars a year in transaction volume, right? Masterworks has one hundred and forty thousand investors. This year, we'll raise three to four hundred million dollars. So, our our segment of the art market is still is still relatively relatively small. Um, but yeah, it, you know, you, I would I would think of liquidity from an art market perspective. It's frankly probably slightly better than real estate, right? If you own a twenty million dollar home in the Hamptons, it's going to take you a couple of years, maybe one year at best, to sell that home. If you own a twenty million dollar Basquiat, you probably have three or four collectors at any point in time that'll buy that painting. So it's still, you know, it is it is an illiquid asset class, not dissimilar to real estate, but I think it's I think it's better than real estate in many ways, and and obviously it doesn't have carrying costs and the complexity that goes goes with with buying or selling a piece of real estate. Very cool. Well, before I let you go, Scott, I want to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit more about Masterworks. Um, oh, before I do, before I go to that. So with 140,000 investors you have on the platform currently, do you have to be an accredited investor to be on the platform? Walk us through a little bit about what it takes to get set up on the platform. Yeah, the, these are all qualified public offerings. So very similar to how Uber goes public. You can you can go to the SEC's website, um, search for Masterworks, and and literally read every single painting that we've taken public. And today we're taking one painting public every every ten days, roughly valued somewhere between one million dollars and twenty million dollars. Um, so there's there's a bunch of examples out there, but but because they're qualified public offerings, we can sell securities to retail as well as accredited investors. So you don't, you don't have to be accredited. Very cool. Well, before I let you go, Scott, talk to the audience about where they can find Masterworks, where, where they can follow along with what you are doing. By the way, are you uh, personally in on a lot of these deals? Can someone follow along with what you're doing and where your expertise is? Yeah, yeah we're, we're, in, we're in every single deal. So we actually, you know, our management fees are, are one and a half percent uh, per year and then 20% of profit when the painting sells. So we, we earn those in equity because paintings don't produce cash flow. So that, that one and a half percent is earned by issuing ourselves shares and that, that individual vehicles. So uh, our interests are, are entirely aligned with, with investors from, from that perspective. Um, you know, high level, if anyone wants to get involved with Masterworks and, and look at some of these investment opportunities, they can go to the website at www.masterworks.io. Uh, request um, a meeting uh, with our with our membership team and basically get on the phone with one of our representatives and walk through how they're investing today, what their investment objectives are, um, how they think about diversifying into art, what their objectives are with art specifically, and we'll we'll work with people to construct a portfolio that that makes sense for them. Now, what you just threw out there kind of reminds me of like a hedge fund fee structure of sorts. So I'm just curious, how does that compare to the traditional art market with the Sotheby's and the like? What are their fee structures like? I mean, it's it's significantly less. We I actually had a call uh, today with our with our team to just walk them through how to think about traditional art fees versus how how Masterworks um, charges fees. And and the reality is, the art market has tons of transaction fees. Auction houses charge 
um, 20% commissions. Today, I think our, our average commission that we'll pay with an auction house is somewhere around two or 3% just because of our buying power. Advisors charge 10%. We don't use advisors because of a research team and an acquisitions team in house. Um, most collectors pay sales and use tax. We avoid those transaction fees with our with our structuring um, where paintings are, are moved through the state of state of Delaware. So, it, you know, I, the transaction fees historically in the art market have been have been very high, but we've we've created a pretty unique structure that that gets around most of those. Very cool. And so if I go to masterworks.io and is there a way to just subscribe and get notified when these new IPOs are coming out? Yeah. Yeah. As soon as you create an account, you'll receive emails every single time we, we launch a um, launch an offering. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the way to get started. I, you know, I think most people that we talk to 99% of people don't know how to think about art as an asset class. They don't understand returns. They don't understand risk. Um, they frankly don't understand hold period liquidity. So we're, you know, we're kind of educating hundreds of investors a day on, on how to think about a new asset class. Well, you certainly educated me today because I knew very little about the space and I really enjoyed talking to you about it. My wife loves art, so I need to kind of catch up quickly. Um, and this was super helpful and it'll make me look smart later. So I appreciate that. And <laughs> <laughs> really enjoyed our conversation, Scott. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.